good so you had legacy conversations. I'm glad to tell you that we've got SW4E on the other side. He's also known as SB, that's the Afrikaans way of saying it. He's a former sergeant major in the South African Army Special Forces. Uh, some people call me Marekis from the reconnaissance uh, commanders or regiments. They themselves don't use that name. They don't really refer to themselves as Rekis. But that's a common name. And I must say to you, this is one of the most secretive units, the most uh, highly rated special forces units in the world. And we are honored to have Esvia with us. Sometimes I'll call him SW, sometimes Esvia, sometimes Kolk. He answers to all those names. <laughs> and uh, lastly, I want to say to you, we are not native English speakers. We're trying to do this in English for you. There will also be a book, I think about two months from now. It's now the beginning of July, 2021. I think by late August, let's say September, there's going to be a book out on uh, his life in Special Forces. Uh, you shouldn't miss it. This is going to be really good. If you have any questions for us, you are welcome to ask us. Just leave a comment below. If I might ask you, though, if you have a certain question or a specific question, just tell us where in the video uh, you found something which you want to know more about. So say to me at minute 22, and then you ask me a question. Because by the time that we look at the questions, it's a couple of weeks may have gone by, and it's hard for us to go back and to look at every question and then re-look at the videos just to try to answer you. But we will answer all questions at some stage, as long as it's polite. Uh, there's some people uh, we found when we recorded this in Afrikaans, there were a few people who made a few snotty comments and a few racist comments. Absolutely assure you we've gone past those days and we're just going to block you. Now, Esvia, can you tell me just in a few minutes or two about your background in Special Forces, if you can just take it together for the, for the listeners here, and then we will go to your childhood. Okay, uh, great. Uh, like Chris said, I'm Esvia, SW, born 1958 in Namibia. I'll cover that just now. Uh, I joined Special Forces, one reconnaissance commando in 1978, and I left in 1988, March, end of March. So I spent 10 years there. Most of the 10 years, a small portion was training, retraining. A big portion was rehearsals for operations, and the better part, I would say about eight months, a year was deployment, deployed somewhere in the neighbor countries. I specialized in explosive. Uh, we will cover that later on. There was a benefit of that, is that you got included in the one night stand operations. We deploy one night, mess up what you need to mess up, and you're back. That was one benefit of getting qualified in explosives. So we start with Namibia, Chris. Yes, about your childhood, but let me just also say, uh, to, if you're new to this channel, uh, this is not an interrogation. This is a legacy conversation. In other words, what we're doing here is to talk to, to former soldiers on this specific playlist. There is another one for former policemen. We, we talk to them and just to get the history, the background, and just to make sure that their views come out. So it's not supposed to be interrogation or, you know, a court case or anything. We're just talking here as friends. I'm sure that this W has just uh, come from a braai or a barbecue, as, as we call it in South Africa. I'm stuck in Switzerland, so he might, might even have a beer there with him to take a, <laughs> a, a sip now and then. It's not a problem. Uh, it's, it's not supposed to be uh, overly official you know, and overly serious, but it is a serious matter. So tell us, is there a way, where were you, you say you were born in Namibia. Uh, in those days, it was called something else. It was Southwest Africa. Yeah, it was called Southwest Africa. Yeah, it was a German colony. Um, it's north of South Africa, and it's south of Angola, on the eastern border is Botswana, and then on the west coast is the Atlantic Ocean. Very cold water. I was born 1958 in Office Bay. Uh, it was a town just above Swakop on the west coast. Um, went to school, matriculated in Yamua, 
my whole family line runs back from being born and bred in Namibia. My great grandfather, Hendrik Reinhardt, fully, he was killed in 1904. I actually got a photo of the graves, and two other guys were also killed there. What happened is the Nama tribe, Nama is one of the tribes in Namibia, there's about 15, 20 tribes in Namibia. That specific tribe was Vitboy. So at that stage, they were fighting against the Germans, um, German soldiers. And for one or other reason, they decided that the white people in Namibia, a lot of them came from South Africa and they moved upwards to Angola. All of a sudden, also, they were enemies to the Namas. So at one day, they cornered some of the whites and said, no, but all they need to do is just hand over their weapons. Uh, they needed to, get, to fight against the Germans. And good hardly the, the white people did that. One of them was my great grandfather, great great grand, no, great grandfather. And the Namas just start shooting them. Uh, they shoot him, they shoot a little boy through his hand. And while his mother was bandaging his hand, they shot him three or four more shots. Then my grandfather uh, started to cry and he cried extremely hard and heartbroken and for one other reason they decided to spare his life so they gave him back to his mother uh, yeah fortunately for us because if they killed him I wouldn't have been here today yeah so the war carried on and eventually uh, they killed a lot of whites there and then a German I think about 120 German soldiers arrived and they did the counter-attack. In the long run, that specific tribe was nearly wiped out because they never stopped fighting. Uh, we're not going to go into that, but yeah. So that is more or less what happened with my family. Then my grandpa, then another tribe, my Eriru, from the Herreros. Uh, my Herreru grave, his soldiers, uh, a task to wipe out all the newborn baby boys in Khubawa's area. That's on the western side of, of uh, Namibia, close to the border of South Africa. So what they did, they went to farm from to farm and they killed all the baby boys. But my uh, grandfather were tipped off by one of my heroes second in command because they liked the family and they dressed my grandfather in a girl's dress. So he was the only one that survived there and the boy next door on the neighbor farm. They were the only two that survived. So yeah, that is my history. Maybe that makes sense why I also end up in the army. <laughs> it looks well, like it was almost not like in the army. Um... I just have to say, I'm glad you explained that this here because in the you know, Afrikaans version of this recordings, of these recordings, and if you can listen to Afrikaans and you understand the toll, you're welcome to go and listen to it. It's not the same. It's the same story, but you know, um, we weren't reading from something. We were talking about, what, out of memory, about things which happened more than 40 years ago when you were in the army. Uh, these things when your great grandpa was murdered, uh, we're talking about the turn of a century. That was about 1905, or right about there, I think. Yeah, 1904. On, 1904. on the gravestone, yeah, you can see it was October 9, 1904. It's on the on the grave, on the stone. I think we'll Tube put stone. a picture in here of, of that, if, if you can send it. To yes. Us. We can yeah, yeah. Here. Because we have quite yeah. a few people asking which for is you. Is yes. Currently quite a few for is in, in, in uh, Namibia. Yeah, it looks like... My great grandfather was one of the first whites that actually moved into Namibia, starting from the southern part of Namibia, moving up. Yeah, they yeah, probably so escaped the um, Anglo Boer War after the English. Yeah, most probably, yes, they did, yeah. Yeah, yeah so and I just want to give a historical background. I mean, this uh, in the English ones is where we have to understand people listening here probably. Almost certainly would not know the South African history that well. 
Um, so the Anglo World War, there were actually two of them. Uh, the first one, the uh, South Africans won, the worst, as they were called, the African nation at uh, Amayuba. They, they killed, uh, they think, about 1,200 English. Might be less, might be more. I don't want to go into statistics. I'm just talking, explaining the history. Uh, you can visit it if you can ever get to Amayuba at uh, uh, the battlefield. There's, there's two guys there. And then, sadly, for South Africa, uh, for the Afrikaner, they discovered gold. 74% of the world's gold in the old Transvaal Republic as well as in the Free State Republics were independent at that stage and they were model republics. They were now apartheid there. This, these two people were followed. Basically, the, the Dutch forefathers in the Nava were acting. And then they discovered the gold. Uh, the British Empire wanted the gold. The war broke out three years. Um, uh, the Afrikaner fought the British to a standstill. It cost them more than any other war ever uh, before the First World War. It cost them in casualties uh, more than any other war. And I always have a joke, and as a response, I would tell you the first standing order in the South African army and police, and it's probably still like that, is if you see anything in khaki, which is the English, then you have to still start shooting. And if you don't start shooting, <laughs> you will be in trouble. <laughs> that's why, um, and then that's why when after the war, there was a genocide which took place as well, which you can go and find out about. Uh, the English on it off the, uh, the women and the children, including black people from the farms. The farms are supporting the commandos, uh, uh, who are uh, cavalry units. And so they rounded them off, burnt the farms, killed all the livestock, put them into concentration camps. You know, you can argue left, you can argue right, but I will ask you not to argue with me too much about this because it is history that one out of every three child and woman who, who ended up in those concentration camps died. And there are some historians, including myself, as well as our sponsor, who will tell you that it had to do uh, that, that caused apartheid. But I don't want to go into that. The point I'm trying to make here is that a lot of South Africans, Afrikaners, uh, after the war decided they will not give an oath of loyalty towards the English Queen or King. Queen, Queen Victoria actually died during the war and we applauded. And then uh, they left. And so they would go to a place like Southwest Africa, which was then known as German West Africa. And of course, being a German colony, they didn't have to give a Oh, sadly, it didn't work like that because by 1915, when the First World War, uh, the Afrikaner, actually the Union of South Africa now, attacked and conquered uh, German West Africa and it became known as Southwest Africa and was ruled for many years on a League of Nations mandate. Okay, SW, I'm so sorry. I, uh, no, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. Yes, well... Uh, I think really, I think people listening here might not know all the history. They should read, you know, the sponsor of our GMJ's books uh, because he goes really deep into history. The man is slightly insane. But since we both know him, we will forgive him. He's, he's a likable fellow besides that. So you yourself, you were born in 1958. By, by that time, I suppose you were on the farm, even if you were born in a town, Wolfers Bay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we didn't stay th that long on a farm then. You know, thereafter, my father, we were on a farm uh, close to Okanya. So I went to primary school, Okanya. Thereafter, I went to Yamua High School, where I finished matric. Um, I was in the hostel. The hostel is like that. You can go out Saturday morning from 8 till 10 to town. And then uh, the hostel for the boys was separate to the hostel for, for the girls. So it would be like that. We would go on a Saturday morning, 8 till 10, and we'd back. And then only there after the girls were allowed to go to town. Okay, I was prefect in school, and I was, uh, what do you call a Wilson principal? Uh, uh, Wilson? Ed Boy. Ed Boy in, in the hostel. Now you get elected by the other kids. So one other reason that they thought I would be the right guy to do it. But um, 
in matric, I sneaked out one night, late at night, and I visited a girlfriend of mine. And when I came back, they caught me. And that was the end of that title. Luckily, before they took my bats, for being a prefect in the school, the, the yearbook, the photos were already taken. So at least I made that. <laughs> but I never showed my parents the yearbook because that was only the picture of being me being a perfect prefect. Yeah, then well, it's I... interesting to me because when I was listening to you in the first series, in the Afrikaans version of what we're talking now, I saw the beginnings of a Special Forces member because there were certain things in your life, even as a child, uh, which I thought would suit uh, Special Forces people. In the fact that you had leadership positions, but still you preferred in sport, the long distance running, that type of thing when you're on your own. But you could fit into a small team as well. It didn't bother you. And then you had this fantastic love of nature. I believe you started yes. sleeping out in the felt long before. Well, I suppose you were still five, six, seven years old. Yeah, but, but with uh, uh, three times a year, you would, there's, it's holiday, then you can see your parents. So you only see your parents three times a year. So that was like already preparing you for defense work. Then when I arrived on farm, I would disappear early in the morning with a .22 rifle. I never shot anything, seldom. And then I would, my aim was to crawl up to animals and see how close I can get to him, like kudu or jackal or whatever. And that was, um, from there you start learning nature, you start learning the bird sounds, and you know which bird is close to water and which is far away from water and you would listen to animal noises so one night i decided to one night to go and camp by myself i was seven years old small little tent luckily i told my parents more or less where i was so i was about seven eight k's from the farm itself from the from the house so i walked up to a river dry a river so i camped there on the side and yeah but Seven, eight o'clock, you start hearing all these noises. Uh, what I didn't know, there was leopards as well. I only found out that much later. And luckily for me, my mother decided, no ways. The sun is too small to sleep out one night. So they drove down the road. When they hit the river bit, I was there. <laughs> Quite glad to go home again. <laughs> well, that's that was... interesting because I have to also once again, and people should forgive me if I know this already, but I'm trying to... To think if myself, if, if you're listening here and you're perhaps a foreigner, as we call you, you might not know it, but Namibia, Southwest Africa, is one big paradise. It's probably one of the last remaining wild areas in Africa, probably the world. You can drive down the road and see a damn elephant standing there next to the road. And by the 10th time you've seen it that day, you're not that concerned about it. But the animals there are, are wild it's quite possible that they can kill you and they can certainly kill a small kid of seven years old, even if he has a point two two yeah. rifle with <laughs> <you. laughs> Yeah, so that, that was my introduction to nature. So three times a year you would be on a farm. Holidays would normally be three weeks, except December, that's four weeks holiday. Okay. Then I finished my trip in 77. 1977, and oh yeah, I was called up, wasn't called up for the army. So all the Namibian, Southwest African boys that finished matric were called up for defense force, compulsory defense force service in South Africa, as we were part of South Africa. And, and Standard 9, everybody received their call up papers except me. So I took one of my friends, letters and I copy the address and I post it. You can't believe it, but the post system worked. <laughs> and about two weeks later, here's my call-up instructions to one special service battalion, which I believe with that before that were for all the young guys that was untrainable. They would send there. <laughs> but it changed. Then it became like light armor. It wasn't armored like armored school, but they had the rattles and the elan and uh, 
I believe the Roy Cup, all that kind of vehicles actually became part of one is to be. So I finished uh, 1977 and I spoke to a friend of mine, Gert de Plessis, and he reminded me that he dropped me off at, at the station on the 2nd, the 2nd of January, 1977. Sorry, I finished my trip 1976. So 1977, the 2nd of January, I had to climb on a train and he reminded me we out the eve, we had a party right through the night. Now they were celebrating, not celebrating, but it was my farewell. <laughs> and then he said, we carried on on the 1st of January and the 2nd of January, he took me to the railway station. Even though there's that typical scene of mothers crying, girlfriends crying, and there we go, to Bluefontaine. We were called up there. That was my yeah, basic. Bluefontaine is, is quite far away from where you started. And I just want to say to people, Despite its name, one special what special one service. special service battalion. Yes, it's not special forces. It's got nothing to do with special forces. Nothing this is yeah, like an armor regiment. Um, yeah, and then we'll put pictures here of Rottles and the yellow and all those things for people to admire. Yeah. So, but that's quite far away. Right? That's down in South Africa, in the middle of South Africa. You're you're in Namibia. Yeah, that's more than a thousand kilometers easily, which you now have to go yeah. on the train. Yeah, and then I had my first introduction to the Defence Force discipline. There was a young corporal walking up and down, and he, he looked at me and he said, but you didn't shave. Now, I have typically metric attitude. I said, why do I have to shave? I'm not in the army yet. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, down, 10 push-ups. So I did my 10 push-ups. He said, 10 more. And I did my 10 more. And he said, oh, you're from Namibia, 10 more. And then he left me. <laughs> so that was my introduction to South African Defence Force. So this was like a troop train, yes, yeah? Oh, well, oh, there was just people troops. also on there. Oh. Yeah, there was only troops, and we they dropped us off in Bloemfontein. You know, you get one special service battalion, then you get one parachute battalion, and then you get a uh, school of armor. Uh, that was Willy Fontaine's. Uh, so there they dropped us off, and when we arrived at the gate, uh, same scenario, all the ladies standing outside crying, crying, and inside, they were already cutting the guy's hair. There was only one style. It was nearly like yours. <laughs> it's a little bit longer. Yes, it's it not quite long for those days, but I have to say, this is the 1970s. I mean, probably some people at this side burns as well, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah, so yeah, we cut them all the hair, and I have to say, January... Bloemfontein in South Africa is damn warm. It's hot. I mean, South, Southwest Africa is very warm as well, but, but that's a warm place. Yeah. That, that is basics, three months basics. So it's irrelevant where in South Africa you were called up. Your basic is exactly the same. It's not one point you're going to be a, a signaler, you're going to be a chef. It's exactly the same. So everybody do exactly the same basics. Then uh, South African Special Forces started their recruiting. So, but they had authority to go to all units right over South Africa and recruit guys that were interested. So, how they start off, they called us together in a, in a movie hall and they showed us this nice video of a guy, Taffy Pelzer, driving in a beach buggy with his maroon beret and then his wings there on his chest. And then a young lady sitting next to him, putting her fingers and touching his wings. So that, that kind of thing. And they, wow, everybody wants to join. And they said, okay, give you about an hour, put on your tackies, bring your rifle. We will meet you on the rugby field. I think we were about 400 and only 20 pitch up. <laughs> 25 in total. So they would ask you a couple of questions. Uh, you did a a 2,4 run with your rifle and tackies. That was with boots, no boots on. And then, of course, they had the specific time, the army that you have to finish in at least 10 minutes or something like that. So they would do your push-ups and sit-ups and then interview again and let you do a couple of things that you work as a team. And then they selected only myself and Spock Puerta, Terry Puerta, Spock Puerta. So that was the only two that I decided they interested in, and they do exactly that right over South Africa. And then they would send us um, 
to port, I think the three side, South African Infantry uh, Unit. And uh, I remember we were, when I arrived here, we were about three, 300, then some will uh, leave again. Then they will fill it up with another 100. If, if I might stop you, is there, there's something you forgot to tell us. Uh, you're passing out parade, I think. Oh, yes. Yes, yeah, something said. happened there. Yeah, you're not going to oh, escape yes, us. Yes, yeah. We want to know. Well, yeah. The, at the end of your, your three, week, uh, three months, they will have everybody on parade. Then they would say, okay, who is the guys that's interested to become chefs? And they would form a platoon there. Who is the guy that wants to stay infantry? Who wants to go to armor school? And so they would split you up all over. And I had jipper guts and I disappeared. And when I came back, everybody was gone and there was a small group still standing there. There were about 15 guys. And I jumped into that group. Yes, and the RSM we would climb into us. So what are we going to do with you? You're not interested in anything. Now he's talking to this group. So that was the guys that didn't want to do anything. <laughs> so I waited <laughs> until, until they dispersed us and I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> yeah, and then we were three sides. So we started off 300. I think we only end we were about 600 in total. And then they would start doing basic introduction. Now, now the guys that started uh, the training with us is uh, operators, what we call operators. They qualified operators, special forces operators. So they were the instructors now. They would give a little bit of medics, a little bit of signal, a little bit of explosives, took us out um, to shoot. Uh, and then they started getting more intensive training. The one training which I would, was quite heavy to me and to most of the other guys, you have to walk 30 k's with 30 kilograms within six hours. Now, and of course, your rifles, your rifle and your boots. And one of, I think about four liters of water. That was a, a crucial test. How much did you weigh at that stage? I just want to bring this into balance. 30 kilograms is, is heavy. It's, it's yeah. quite heavy. And, and you were weighing what? About 72 kilograms, so I'd nearly half my so weight. If you add weight your rifle, yeah. yeah, add your rifle, water bottles, and you had, I think, one or two magazines as well for your rifle. It was a R1 rifle, which is a heavy rifle. And you, this went you on for believe. how long? This, this pre selection phase, what, how long did that go on at port? That was uh, eight weeks, if I remember correctly, eight to nine weeks. And then uh, we ended up of the 600, I think 90 were actually the guys that they decided, they elected to go on uh, the axle selection course, which was in Brazil in the top. That's now on the uh, eastern side of South Africa. Yeah, that's where the that's Indian Ocean is, where the Zulu people are. That's, that's it. what that's they say here to, to those who don't know, but the South African... I always say South African Army Special Forces because the police had the unit as well. Um, they never had a selection failure rate of less than 90%. It's usually about 95%, which means that nine out of every 10 men who's fit and who's determined and who's, who's, who fancy themselves, who's already been uh, pre-selected, you know, they just didn't arrive there, they, they were selected uh, to even go on that course to try, their, to try it out. Nine out of ten will fail. It's not a matter yeah. of perhaps they will fail. And there was more than one course, I believe. I know exactly one uh, indeed, where not a single man could make it. And I don't think it has changed. It's like this even to today. I believe if we uh, look at your Special Forces League website, I'll put it in here. Uh, 100,000 men tried and 481 made it. So it is impossible to pretend you were there if you were not there. Uh, we will get to that at the later stage. Okay, right, Israel, now we are in somewhere in KwaZulu-Natal. I know that the uh, reconnaissance commanders at uh, oh, they still do huge training ground there. So, so what happened to you there? Yeah, we first, we climbed on a train and we departed to Durban. We were there for, I think, only four or five days. 
And then we were in a train again, uh, if I remember correctly. And then we would go up to Lake Sabaya. It was close to Lake Sabaya. That's, I think, a Sotwana Cape Vidal, Cape Vidal, that side. That was the, it was a, not densely populated, which they preferred. So we, otherwise we could get food from the locals. But what we didn't know, and we soon realized, whenever we approached locals for food, they would point blank refuse to give us anything. So uh, we heard afterwards they contacted all the local local radio stations and tell them about these guys that's going to be there and don't give them anything, not water, not food, nothing. <laughs> so, and we were probably close to 80 that went on the election. So it wasn't only our own group. There were some guys that fall off previous selections. There was um, permanent force guys that joined us. There was a two foreigner guys, three foreigner guys, Jokau, I believe Jokau brought also brought a book out. Uh, there was Major Schofield. He will come to the picture a little bit later, King. Uh, there was a guy from Friends Legion as well. So these guys joined us from all over. And from the beginning, everything that you do, you were divided into teams. And every time they would uh, select a new team leader, then you would get a, a compass bearing and then they will add some spice to it. They will give you a pole and it's, it's what, 12, 12 feet long. And at least, you, I'm going to say, this size in diameter, heavy. It's not dried out. And then you have to carry that to your next RV point. At least besides your normal gear, besides your rifle and your yeah. rucksack. Yeah, and the rucksack. Yeah, that stage it was basic South African issue. It wasn't anything special force. So it was R1s and, and that kind of thing. And then, of course, you had water, no rat packs because you weren't survival. You have to walk to the next place where you would get food. So if you fall off in between, bad luck for you. Uh, for one one RV point they gave to us was they said, here's the compass bearing. You have to walk through these thick bushes until you can't walk anymore. Now, that could mean two things. You either fell over out of tiredness or there is an obstacle there. So we ended up walking right into the ocean, which we didn't even know we were there. So we walked right into the Indian Ocean. And that's where they... So this of course, was we were, after quite a few hours. I mean, you were walking over. How many hours were you walking before you got to the ocean? And more than a day. Hours? More than yeah, a day. More, yeah, more than a day, yeah. So uh, you would just walk. I mean, you don't stop. You, you would carry this pole, your equipment, everything. Would there be instructors close to you? Would you be on an observation? Or, no, um, no way. Just no way that, yeah, there was no way instructors involved until we, they meet up with you again. And then, of course, of some of the teams hit it, didn't hit the actual RV, so they would be driving up and down instructors and getting all the teams together again. Uh, that was, I remember it was like dunes close to, to the beach, and then they would start chasing you up and down in the, in the dunes. And we would do live fire as well, uh, not fire and movement. Static, you would lie and they would, you would shoot on, on a actual targets with a rifle that wasn't cleaned, so that it was stoppages. Yeah, so for us it was quite interesting. Why didn't they keep, why did they give us new rifles when we started? I mean, it was next to the sea with the rust. You didn't, I think we had cleaning kits, but that was the last thing on your mind, to clean your rifle. And then, of course, you had live ammo, one, ma one magazine yeah, that you carry with you. And that's it. Um, then and there's live animals here, something which can bite you. And in this area of, of Kozulu Natal, as we call it today, mm -hmm. Natal province. Ironically, uh, we would walk on the beach. One of our compass bearings was walking north onto the beach. Uh, sounds nice, but it's very difficult to walk in that uh, kind of sand. And we saw one or two crocodiles. So as we approached them, they would go into the sea. So they must have come down one of the rivers 
and flooded into the sea. So that was quite an uh, interesting picture. Here is a crocodile lying on the beach. And I remember one night we had that specific compass bearing. We walked till late at night, till we were nearly fell over of tiredness. And we stopped. We took out a ground sheet, it was like a plastic uh, sheet that's uh, waterproof. Pull it over our heads, and we, I think we were six guys left in, in our team of 10. And the next morning, as you woke up, you would just see little sand heaps as the wind was howling right through the night and building up sand over us. So then you would stand up, carrying on. And of course, uh, that was, I think, in, in, in summer. Mosquitoes in uh, KwaZulu Natal is unbelievable. I mean, they like helicopters. <laughs> so you need that plastic cover, pull it over your body. Nothing can eat them alive but by the mosquitoes. I yeah, want so to, to ask something quickly, yeah, is, is just, just, to, just to confirm. You start walking with this huge pole of yours. What happens if one or two guys decide they don't want to continue? You don't get extra people there. That means that you, who's a remainer, yeah. still have to carry that pole. Um, so it makes it harder for you if, if, if one of you. Yeah, guys... it does. It means you, we could previously swap every hour on the pole. Now you have to swap every half an hour or something. So yeah, it was, and it wasn't easy. Uh, if it was that pole, was just getting more and more heavy. Uh, and then we swap half an hour, half an hour. Yeah, so if, if you lose guys in your team, you bug it. <laughs> you have to arrive with the pole. And that was very clear. If you arrive without the pole, they send you back to go and get the pole. Otherwise, you're off the course. So, so I you need can't to just ask you, if, if the instructors, when, when you did see them, were they like supportive or were they the typical negative? Um, you know what I mean? I mean, I've never seen a major in my life except for you. Uh, would they no, be they, nice or supportive guys? Come on, let's try. Okay, no, they or would, would they just ignore you? What would they do? No, that, there was nothing positive from their side. It's like everybody had it in his mind. We don't need you in our army. We are special enough. Uh, I got the idea specifically because I got involved with it, uh, selections later on. The new model. I realized the old model was walk on a compass bearing, add some weight onto you, uh, wait for you at the end of, of that specific leg where the new selection was completely different. You get monitored every minute, every hour. Um, one thing they did with us is that they give each guy a sandbag, which you also have to carry now. So now you got your individual weight with you. You can't swap to your body and so forth. And we were next to Lake Sabaya, which, of course, is full of crocodiles. And they said, strip your webbing, leave your rifle, take your sandbag, go into the lake as far as you can walk until you disappear under the water. And, of course, they will be standing on the side with their rifles. So if there is anything that looks like a crocodile, they will fire over your heads, which they did sporadically. If they see th something that looks like a crocodile, they would fire. I mean, that crocodiles, you get up to eight, 10 feet, um, will grab you, they wouldn't even know you got. I remember you would walk and then the sand back from here onto your head because now the water starts moving up until, and they would push you, carry on, carry on. And of course, there was a reason for that so that your sand back is wet and it's double the weight. <laughs> but um, did they start shooting while you're in the water? And then if I did, what do you do? Do you then start running on top of the water out? <laughs> you <laughs> have to understand, to... folks, we're talking at about that, that all is, here. <laughs> it's only your head, head sticking out. Um, and I'm sure that wasn't even on the schedule. It was like each instructor that arrived there decided, okay, what can I do to make sure there's less of you that's going to pass this election uh, selection course? And... Um, yeah, so that carried on. And one incident, uh, we were sitting in our team waiting for the next uh, in instructions where to go. And they arrived and they said, yeah, guys, we think we're getting, we're feeling sorry for you. Uh, and they picked one guy and sent him around and said, make a list of 
everything that you want. Now, on top of your list, everybody wants bread or kudens milk. And your name will be added, what you want, and your money, and then give it to the instructors. And now we wait, and about an hour later, they came back with beers. That's it. That was your money. <laughs> and we are naive to believe them. <laughs> oh, yeah, they said, and then they said, now we did bring you something. We did bring you some bread. And yeah, they take out, I think, four or five loaves. Yeah. And we had a craving for meal, I mean, like bread or anything like that. And when you took that first bite, it was just petrol spurting out of the bread. So I put it in gasoline first. <laughs> yeah, we, the, no, that's we, nasty. we decided that's nasty. because you're so hungry, let's try to light it and see if there's anything left that's edible. Ah, it just box and a little bit of dust left. <laughs> And I, I recall you told me in the previous one that now uh, I have to explain this again to the listener here that in Namibia it's a very seldom thing to see somebody speaking English even as badly as we, as, as we do. Uh, they just don't speak English there. It's either Afrikaans or some German perhaps, but they don't speak English. Or oh, then a, a, a native language. Yeah, what yeah. a native language like Ubambu. Yeah, so English, Ubambu, Ubambu. English was the fourth language. <laughs> yes, English was a fourth language and definitely not in public. So even <laughs> though we had it at school, I was in Namibia too at school. Uh, funny enough, in the same time as you, but of course I'm younger than you. You wouldn't believe it, but mm -hmm. I am. So, yes, yeah, so you arrived in South Africa, unable to really speak English. Now, Bluefontaine's not a problem. Bluefontaine's the same, it's Afrikaans. You try yeah. to speak English there and they'll probably start shooting at you. Even today, <laughs> uh, you know, I was there for what, six, five, six years at the university there and did my articles. So you arrived in KwaZulu Natal, which is now, this, this place is now called the last English outpost, even to this day. You find a lot of English expats there and they're very proud of it. Wonderful place, wonderful place to live in South Africa, where the Zulu nation is. But you arrive not really able to speak English that well, and they team you up with, I believe, a, a English officer. Uh, was it there or, or was it in the future? Um, perhaps I'm confused. Yeah, that's on uh, survival course. Oh, on survival course. Okay. Yeah, and it was Major Schofield. So we will come to that story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll come to that. Of course, you became a survival instructor yourself in later yeah. years. Okay, well, I just found it in a, uh, quite funny because I know the South African army isn't really, in those days, uh, they didn't really want to speak English that much. So I suppose all the orders and everything were just coming from Afrikaans, at least Eitlanders or the foreigners, as we call them. Yeah. Uh, they just had to learn quite quickly the, the few words which they needed to know. Great, so that was the end of the uh, election. So we called it selection. And then we were sent back to Durban. So we were, yeah, I can't remember, it's more than 40 years back. I would say about 25 guys, but now we have the same scenario. Then other guys that finished previous selections, but there was only maybe one or two guys left, or guys that had to go away for family matters. They would join us now for the second phase. Um, so your first training is 18 months. That uh, includes selection until you're operational. So your last course would be minor tactics. So and in you between... People were the, um, you were the first large group to Correct. go through selection. The, the special forces was formed and then came you lot. You, you people came just after that. Yeah. yeah we, we, the special forces actually only started in late 75, 76, so we were there 77 as, as, a, as a massive crew. Uh, that was the first time that they do this thing, this exercise where they would recruit right over South Africa. Uh, they've never done that before. So that was why we were such a big crew. And in their minds, it's, you weren't supposed to be there. Somewhere you jump it. You can't be such a big group. But they didn't go back and see how many were there before when we started? So we, we go to Durban. That now, and I give you a four or five days, no, two or three days break to get back on your feet. And we were thin, thin, thin. I've got a photo there of me and Dave Davis, a good friend of mine, where we finish 
selection. Then you would start with basic, basic signal, basic DEMS, basic uh, everything basic, basic course. So everybody would do exactly the same. Uh, what was there that I'm missing now? Uh, so that, and that would be over a span of 18 months. And in that 18 months, you can say, okay, yeah, I really like working with explosives. Uh, of course, we, we also did um, basic parachuting. For that, we went back to Bloemfontein. So we didn't do the very specific selections. We had to carry a marble. I think the marble is 10, 15 kilograms. Uh, carry it around on, on, on the rugby field. It's not like you're going to carry it 30 k's. You have to climb a wall. And I believe a lot of guys fell off there because they weren't strong enough in their arms to pull themselves up with the webbing and rifle and climb over the wall. Um, we didn't do that part. Now, of course, of course the bats, parabats didn't like that. They said, no, you're supposed to finish our selection before you can do our parachute course. Now, of course, that was sorted out on top level, on the high bronze level. Not That wasn't for us to say. But it was like a, a hostility against us. Not by the, the other soldiers, but more from higher up hierarchy. Uh, I think we are chipping, we didn't finish their specific well, course. If I might explain, you know, the army, what did you call them in Afrikaans? Uh, is there something since? Uh, Pretorian Sians or something, you had a word for the army headquarters, which I couldn't. Esavian uh, Sians, wasn't it? Esavian Sians, yeah. Yes, and I can translate this is South African Defense Force and SALT, uh, which yeah. is one of the terminology he uses. You, you would remember that as uh, we told us here, he came to, um, to Bloemfontein originally, where he was first selected or recruited. Now, I just want to tell you, those two units, the armor guys and the parachute battalion, really hate each other. It's exactly. not a question of, of liking or talking about it. If you walk around in your black armor beret and there's a guy coming with his maroon uh, paratrooper beret, a fist fight is, is, is a given. Forever. And yes, and they would hunt each other, uh, really, they would hunt each other. And uh, I was in a police where I finished with a police there. Uh, the last few months I was in a police station. <coughs> and quite now and then we would actually find these two groups battling it out. I must say the armor guys normally won because they were physically bigger. Uh, the paratroopers weren't that big, but they were fit and they were tough. There's no doubt about it. So they had their own selection, which was anything between four days and 14 days, depending yeah. on when you were there. It is nothing. And I'm not, I'm not, um, bringing them down, but it's absolutely nothing against the one of special forces. And why do I say this? Because folks, I can prove it uh, by just looking at the statistics. If you look at the statistics, you will find out that about 30%, you know, my wife is an English teacher, uh, wonderful person, we'll, we'll talk about her now and then, uh, but she says, I cannot say 30 in English, so I'm gonna raise my three fingers. That's <laughs> three, 10, 20, 30. Because <laughs> he says I've got a horrible accent, which is true. And 50% uh, of them normally would fail the selection of this. That's nothing against the 90%, 95% of special forces. That's why I say it. And just to bring it again into the perspective here, your green berets in, in the US, and we're not knocking them, them at all, uh, they and French Army Special Forces, British SAS, the other SAS units, uh, have about 64%, that, that's their failure rate, um, which is still, it's not close to 90%. In fact, the closest unit which comes uh, into selection criteria would be the, the US Navy SEALs, uh, and under them I would call it the Delta unit. It comes to about 90%. Normal SEAL about 80%, Delta goes a little bit up. Uh, but Delta, of course, sorry, is, is, is Army, it's not, it's not seen till six. Let me just repeat that before you think I'm on being silly here. Yeah. But I'm trying to say to you that the parrot groupers really had no reason to complain like this. I just felt they were the elite of the army because they were the parrot troopers and as conventional infantry, they were very, very good. They would do the, um, 
helicopter assaults and they would lead the infantry, but they couldn't really fight this infantry for long because they weren't equipped to do it. They always had to be rescued by the tanks, by the armor guys. So that's one of the fights which always started. Um, the, the paratroopers would shout to the armor guys that uh, something about Arnhem, you know, 1944, and why they're still waiting, and then the fight starts. So anyway, so now you're back where you have to do your basic paratrooper training. Um, and yeah. you have now these people who don't really like you because you haven't gone through their selection, which I just explained. Okay, so what happens during this basic, uh, I think it's static line, static line training. Of course, yeah. you went on and you didn't yeah, know it's what well. we, Yeah, it's static line uh, parachutes, ironically, exactly the same ones we would use later when we deployed operationally. And the benefit of that parachute is that you can't steer it. So where you jump out, you go directly to the ground. And of course, if the wind is not as strong, then if I remember correctly, you would do eight jumps and that would include one night jump and one jump worth a marble. The marble is just a block of cement. Can't remember the actual weight. I think it's about 20 kilograms. And then you would wrap that in a canvas, strap it, and then it will be hooked onto a belt. Uh, and then when you jump out, you would release the, the marble. Yeah, and there it would happen if the guys didn't pack it very nice. You would see marbles raining, <laughs> hitting the ground. Well, that can that... certainly kill you. I mean, paratroopers are quite proud of that. I have a few stories about that hitting one of their vehicles. But yeah, they can come and, and tell that themselves. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that would have been the last time I would jump so uh, orderly. You, you, you shuffle step your left foot in front and your right foot will meet up and it's one, two, one, two, until you pro approach the door and, and first the red light on and you're ready, one, two, and then the green light will go on and then the instructor will hit you in your back and you will go out like that while the rest keeps the shuffle. You keep up close to each other. The idea is when you hit the ground, you close by. Now, in reality, in the bush, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> well, every <laughs> time you jumped in the bush, as we call it, um, that would have been seen as a combat jump, of which a paratroopers had did very few. I know about one, a major one, which they did. Uh, yeah. Normally, the paratroopers were not in the war as paratroopers. They were there as airborne assault people working with helicopters. as Romeo Mike teams, but uh, they can come and explain them themselves. Is the auto, what aircraft were you jumping here? It was the Dakota, that was known, the DC -3, known as uh, the DC-3 in, in the US. Or, yeah, Dakota, yes. uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, that is Air Force, that's not Army. The Air Force would then arrive uh, where? At uh, Tempe, the Air Force uh, strip there next to... Yes, yes, we would go there. And I think we had one jump out of the C-160. And the, or the yeah, C1, Achilles C130, the one with the four. Four engines. That is the yeah. C130, yes. Yeah. So, so the South African Air Force basically had three aircraft there they could use. It was the DC3 of the Dakota, C47, I believe it's also called, uh, the C130 Achilles, and then the C160 Promsol. That's so correct. You were yeah. jumping mostly out of the Dakota, and then you say one jump out of Achilles. Is it yeah. totally different? Yeah, it was just getting over the anxiety, anxiety of jumping out of a Dakota. Now it's the C-130, everything, there's more noise. <laughs> more noise, more, more other paratroopers with you. Uh, thumb suck, I think about 50. Now there's guys that will take me on, no, it's 40, 60, but it's not about that. Uh, but it, it takes three or four times more than a Dakota. Can I, ask you, can I ask you something here, a night jump? Can you tell me a night jump? Because remember now, folks, this is without infrared uh, light goggles or anything. You, you just look at the moon or whatever, and then, then you jump at night. During a training jump now, we will get to the actual combat jumps. Uh, but yeah, when I, you step outside that aircraft and a wind tech gets hold of you, what, what do you think? What, what goes through your mind? If anything, well, of course, I mean, you don't have much to think of. I mean, it's, it's not a lot of time. First, 
you know, if you if you go out of the door, the, the first thing that you do, and it was drill into your head, keep your feet together. And uh, the instructors would be standing uh, on ground level and with their binos. And it's, of course, they count you. So then it's number 10. Your feet went together. Uh, that was still acceptable. But if you hit the ground and your feet weren't together, you would go and sit put it in a corner and I was uh, I was part of that when I hit the ground my feet went together um, of course they have to do all that um, to prepare you for what comes later but they can't prepare you for actual operational job it's completely different uh, what's interesting if you jump out so the first thing you feel is the cold air because Bloemfontein is cold at night and then you just keep your feet together First, of course, uh, your parachute open. The moment your parachute open, you have to look up and see, did it open? That's the view card. One, two, three, look up. It's open. And then you would look to your left, to your right, at the bottom, doing this funny movements. I still remember it. Make sure you know you're not going to hit somebody beneath you. And then you just keep your feet together. Uh, I think we jump about just a little bit more than a thousand feet. Uh, that was the average height that would drop you out. And then you got to about probably uh, 10, 10 more than 10 seconds before you hit the ground. And, and I would not be loaded. No, it was only with weapon, uh, with your weapon. Okay, uh, so, so, so for the training course, you're not loaded as you would be operationally. No, you actually no, almost no. not loaded. Yeah, and I think your uh, your uh, jump with white with the marble was at, was at daytime. I can't remember that we ever did it at night. I think they did us clean just with rifle and parachute for a night jump. And and yeah, that was basically that. But part of the training was they took you out what we call an alpacas, and you have to translate that in English. <laughs> you you go up; it's quite high. It's about 30, 40 feet high. They will hook you on, and it's like a big fan. And then you will jump out. Now, of course, the more you pick up speed, the more resistance from the fan on top. Um, that is to simulate you hitting the ground. Yes, no, that's the standard paratrooper training. It's like a mock aircraft. You climb up to it, and you jump up, and you slide down a wire. I'll yeah. see if I can get some pictures here. It's the only place where they train paratroopers. For the military, I know your unit later trained your own people. Yeah. Uh, but for yeah, the normal did. guys, that is as far as they would go. They would be uh, static line trained. Yeah. The first parachute battalion, which was the national servicemen. And then you had two, uh, I think three and four, which were more the reservist guys. Yeah. Together. Uh, all right. So, so, so you did your paratrooper training. Now you're then qualified we... as a paratrooper. You're still not in special forces. You're still undergoing your. No, if you, you're, you're training, you're you at least, selection. yeah, and, so at least you, you know if you don't make the 18 months with special forces, you come come back as a paratrooper. Uh, then we go back to Durban. Now we do basic, basic signal course, and then we did basic medical. So then we went to two hospitals. One was Addington, King uh, Addington Hospital was on the beach. And then there was King Edward. That was the second phase. That was more for your uh, black population. Um, so King Eddington, we would work in casualties. So whatever arrived from outside being stabbed, that's more in King Edward. Edward, Edward, Edward King Edward Hospital. There you would find stabbing wins a lot. Uh, Ironically, they, the Zulus believe uh, if they, they know they're going to kill you with a knife, yeah, they stab you in both eyes so that your soul can't look at him. So we would find guys that's not dead but with stab wounds and also stab in both eyes. So that was um, a very good preparation for what was coming. Well, not stab wounds, but lungs that collapse, bleeding, uh, high intensive bleeding, fractures, where they hit each other with knobkiris because they're expert fighting with knobkiris, stabbing each other with azagais. 
Now, that's in the Zulu's nature. They like fighting. <laughs> they like the Buddha. <laughs> yeah, no, we're a fierce tribe. I mean, we say this yeah. is right. I mean, they are the guys who, if you look at him wrongly, he's, he's going to take you off. I have yeah. great admiration for the Zulu nation. In fact, uh, our tribes, the Afrikaner and the Zulus, have clashed before. But I want to give another history lesson, but uh, it's in the books. Well, the sponsor we uh, describes that quite a bit. So, so everybody could do certain things. I mean, there were no such thing as a guy just specializing in one thing. Everything, were, everybody was trained in all. And then you yeah. could say like yourself, right, I have a liking in explosives or in money, in your case, we'll get to that. And, uh, you can go and become an expert in that. So everybody could do a basic medical, which wasn't yeah, so basic. Yeah, some guys actually. really liked the parachuting, and that was a benefit of that, is that you were getting involved in show jumps. Some of the guys jumped at Ellis Park. They've met Louis late. Nobody liked him. I, I hope he never listened to us. <laughs> 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 he was the head of a rugby band. He took over from uh, Dr. Kraywagen. Kraywagen. Yeah, he was Kraywagen. the Transvaal Rugby Union. And oh. uh, when they jumped at uh, Alice Park, it was uh, before the Springboks played. Oh, yeah. So the ben benefit of getting into parachuting is that you don't have to go to the bush. <laughs> so I didn't like the parachute. So yeah, for I was you, it's just a method to deploy. It's, it's really not fun. Yeah, a fun and, fun yeah and, and that was specifically ended up being, okay, we'll come to that uh, a little bit later on. Then your your last course will be uh, minor tactics. For, for that, you go to Fort Dopis. That was our Before training. Before you start there, is there, can I just ask you quickly, just remind your memory, uh, when you were working there at the hospital as a yes. medic, of course, a lot of you yeah. then felt nurses as uh, wives, and perhaps not wives, but anyway, company, which is, of course, what young men do. Yeah. Uh, but you had an incident there, which is rather sad, but I would like you to, to tell us about it. Uh, these two hitchhikers, these two oh, yeah, was, so, it who were your own age, it's... actually. They were the same age as you people. Yeah, they were hiking, and, and a guy picked him up. It was towing a ski boat, and on the ski boat, it was four or five tanks of, of, of petrol, 20 liter each. And somebody drove into the boat from behind and, and, and that, that petrol splashed onto it was two guys. And one other reason they, they caught a light and they got severely burnt. I mean, the top skin was missing and the faces. So they were... In a, in, a, in a small room, the two of them. So we were the only guys that actually in and out there uh, attended to the, whenever they were, they didn't really feel any pain. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I'm a, I believe that the first layer of skin is where you feel, that was gone. And their faces were double the size. So but we, we started becoming friends with them uh, and then one day their girlfriends arrived, and so we had to prepare them. We as young soldiers, that if they walk in there, it's not the same guys that they knew before. They they battled speaking, the heads are swollen up. And yeah, yeah, they, they came out shocked there. And I think a couple of days later, both of them died. Yeah, so they unfortunately didn't make it. Uh yeah, we had other incident we had was a lady driving by herself on um, on the freeway close to the hospital. Husband were driving behind her, and she was all of a sudden just swerving over the road, hit the barriers, start spinning. Uh, so she arrived in casualties. So we worked in casualties. So we were the first stop there with the doctors. Sometimes the doctors would leave us and see how far we carry on. But with this lady, the doctor were there. So we started mouth-to-mouth uh, uh, -mouth breathing. Uh, we pumped the heart and we carried on for about five minutes. And, and I could see the doctor, the color on his face turned into like a white color and he asked us, please leave. And he just closed the code. So she didn't, and she was pregnant. I remember that, she was pregnant. So, yeah, she died. So, yeah, we got all, we will start getting prepared for the bush. 
what's right enough. King Edward, of course, we saw more like battlefield, being shot, being stabbed, being hit with a knock near Kiri and uh, being aggressive. Yeah. So uh, w whenever you you were taking into hospital casualties, then before you dispatch, the nurses would give you a, a tetra injection. Now, we were very polite, asked the guy, okay, which side you want it? But not the black nurses. They were just grabbing behind the head, bend him over, and <laughs> stab him <laughs> with the knee. <laughs> well, we were experienced. I mean, and I think if you work long enough in casualties, you do become hardened. You know, you see, well, you, yeah. you can't be scared of blood and that type of thing. You, you can't do your job. Yeah. Okay, so but once you're now done and you, you work as a medic and now you've done your parachuting, I suppose you've done a bit of explosives as well. We'll get to explosives. I mean, you were instructor in that. But yeah, now you get to actually what you people say is a big deal. Small yeah, of course. Things. Just to come to the signal, you learn Morse code as well because once you deployed, you only work with Morse code. You would have a, a, a laminated piece of A4 and on that would be uh, a, B, C, D, which means we're lying up at our RV for the night. So you would only send in Moscow, da -da, da -da 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 -da. and the guys on an HQ would know, okay, A, B, C, D, E means they're into their first RV. Uh, and something else would mean we spotted an enemy, or we spotted armored vehicles. So, so each of that was coded before, and you got a list. And then everybody was trying to uh, to operate in Morse code. And we would work on the TR-48. It later on became the TR, uh, the single 30, a heavy, quite a heavy uh, piece of equipment. Yeah, it's uh, a long distance radius. Yes, long distance, yeah. And then you, minor tactics. Now you will operate as a team and get trained as a team as you would deploy. And there, our instructor were Willie Ward, Koki the Toy, can't remember the other instructors. But I do remember, uh, of course, the, you, you learn fire movement, where you would walk, hit a contract in front, contact, make contact with the enemy, then the guys from the back would sweep forward. And then once you're in a line, you will do fire movement. One guy giving fire support, the other guy will run to the front. Uh, I think we were one of the few armies doing that in a small team. I'm not talking about the battalion. Also. Now we're talking about six to eight guys. That was our standard size of, of operating in as a team. So fire movement, we would then, now we would be on AK-47s. We weren't on R1s anymore. And remember, we had a visit from the Jewish uh, army. Probably also their special forces guys. It was there was a general. There was it was a lot of high brows. And I remember Cocky said, "Okay, you've got now people watching. Carry on the normal way." And we would walk, and we would hit the contact, and we would do in that thick bush fire movement. Of course, you dump your backpack, and then fire movement, and you would come back and pick up your backpack. And I remember as I walked back. I saw one of the Jewish officers trying to pick up my rucksack and he nearly fell over. <laughs> and Koki told us after, yeah, and Koki told us afterwards, the general came to him and said, you know, if our guys do this in the desert, they're going to kill each other. Your guys are doing it in the bushes. It's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's that that's was, very interesting to me. I, I think I said this in your Afrikaans on it also, but it seems aggression was, was quite a big thing here yeah, because you would actually storm these guys shooting all the time. If you have a contact, you move forward. Yeah. Well, many of the Western Special Forces would actually break contact. They would shoot a few shots and then break contact and move back into hiding. Yeah. Um, very interesting how you people did it in your way. Is this also where you did the survival where you were working with a Bushman we yes, 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 yeah. I didn't talk about survival. Yes, so survival, I ended, survival is just before minor tactics. So you finish survival and then you carry on into minor tactics. And then this is in the Caprivi now, this is not in Natal anymore. In, 
Yeah, this is Caprivi in Namibia. It's on the border of Eastern and Western Caprivi. That's on the northern, nor, northeastern side of Namibia. And there was a river, the Kwandu, that in, ends up in Botswana. Before that, it actually comes out of Angola as the Kwandu Kabangu, and it splits into Namibia as Kwandu. Then it goes to Kabang, uh, the Kwangu swamps in Botswana. And then uh, on survival was basically, there's nothing for you to eat. You have to survive on your own. It's not like a selection cause where they will still give you food to eat. Uh, on survival, they don't give you anything. They will teach you, we watch a lot of, uh, we listen to a lot of um, sound clips, like on the old tapes, and then they will show you on a projector, this is a gilback uh, near and full. It doesn't go to water. It only eats certain bugs. So don't follow it. You will never get to water because they don't drink water. So all that kind, and then they would uh, appoint you, uh, appoint a bushman to your team, and then you would deploy in the bushes, and the bushman will show you, you can see this you can eat, this you can eat, and then it would show us, would stop and said, listen, there's bees here, and then you wouldn't even hear the bees. They would stop and start chopping there with the small axes, and there would be like a cup full of honey and small bees that don't sting. And so they learned us tracking, how to follow spur, how to distinguish between human tracks and animal tracks, and how to follow a, what I call a light spur. If somebody walks through the grass early in the morning, it's like a, a light tray on the grass. You can That is the easiest track to follow. So um, we... Uh, one day the instructors came to us and said, yes, guys, it's your happy day. It's your lucky day. There's some meat for you lying down the road, just around the corner. Uh, we walked around the corner. Here's our hina blown up the second day. You know, remember when the Capri, it gets up to 40 degrees. So it was blown up like a balloon. So I took my puma knife, knife and I closed my nose and I stabbed it in the stomach and it blew down. We put it in a big Trebian pot. I think they did give us some onions to, to alter the, chai, the, the taste a little bit. We boiled it for three hours. And that night we had some nice ahina meat. It's like eating your dog. It's the same thing. Well, <laughs> Probably the same thing. you're hungry, you know? The food's good. <laughs> yeah. We had uh, spitting carba. If you put it on the fire, the poison changes into egg yolk. It's not poison anymore. You can eat it. There's not a lot of meat on, on, the, on a snake. But yeah, anything you can eat, you eat. Uh, we put traps um, for guinea fowl, not guinea fowl, pheasants, patrisa. Guinea fowl is tarantal. The small bird. The small bird thing. Yeah, I'll put pictures of us to show people. Yeah. So what we would do that they like crawling into thick grass and that to hide away from uh, from the birds. So what you do, you would take the inner part of a parachute rope. Inside is five, six small thin lines, and that is very, very strong. So you would make a small loop. And each loop would be on the side, make a small cut into a, a grass. Put it in there, the one side, this side, put it in there, and then you got a small loop. And then on the other side, you would tie against the bush. And then they would crawl through there, and that would get stuck around their head. And they would just try to get away. Yeah, get a, a nice meal. And then we would have uh, night lines for catching barbel. You put it out at night, uh, put it on something that's flexible, they do this, so they would grab the worm, start pulling it, and then get caught. So that was our basic food for eight days, yeah. But you could uh, make a fire. I mean, at least you could barbecue yeah. these things. But they didn't yes, give yeah. you matches. No, 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 not at all. You had to make a fire, and the way we did it is you... 
you would have a base that would be either a ruler tree base because it's soft, and then you would have a long stick about 35 centimeters uh, thick as my punky. And then what you would do in the base, you cut on the side like a V-shape. First you make a hole and you cut the V-shape on the side, put it on the ground, and there you would put elephant dung, very dry grass, put it there. Uh, put a little bit of sand in that hole that you make, and then you would start from the top, spinning it. Yeah, we, at one stage we could, within a minute, we would have fire. So out of that wood, a small coal will drop onto the elephant dung, and then you must just blow. And then it catches fire and you can start your fire. Oh, that's so. incredible. So, so once you're done with the survival course, and I'm sure that people were dropping off still, or, or were you now like stable? If, if you no, made no. it this far, you, you sort of made it. Yeah, uh, no, we were still... I would like to uh, probably ask James Taitri. I think he got all the statistics of our course. How many started, how many... Uh, we must get him because I know you also want to speak to him about the profile of a South African Special Forces soldier. Um, we finished 20. I think 20 guys in total finished minor tactics. So okay, that day... This, the, this is from the 600, which you started there back in Port almost a year and a half ago. This yeah, and of course, remember, every time... People were added on that either fell off or was injured, were added on. Same with minor tactics, they didn't finish minor tactics, so they were also added on. So we were more than that, if you have to count everybody that was added on. If, yeah, so it's, we, it's more than that, you're quite right. If I might ask yeah. quickly, uh, is there, and I just want to say to the folks, it's really nice for me to speak to Special Forces members. You hear so many stories. I mean, you people are like mystery man himself. So it's really nice for me to ask questions. Would you say that the instructor's attitude has now changed a bit? Or are we still as, as obnoxious as ever? Uh, I know that you were quite... I'd say that uh, during the first phases, where you were at... Uh, oh, 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 yes. No, they, minor tactics, they were becoming more relaxed, but still very disciplined. But it, it's, a, it's not like in a typical infantry where... Rang, rang weren't that much of an issue in, in our units because you could have a, a sergeant, a staff sergeant like myself that can be, be a team leader. It's not like it have to be an officer. So that was some of the uh, NCOs would become officers. So they would start from where uh, well. So it was much more relaxed between NCOs and officers. But great respect, it, I, would, I would imagine. Yeah, and a lot Probably of the courtesy was still there. Yeah, and a lot of the instructors were in the house. A lot of them with explosives, with minor tactics, with survival. Top of my head, most of them were in the house. So that was a more relaxed atmosphere. Okay, and your commanding officer during this phase was... Uh, Koki the Twain. Koki the Twain. Yeah. Now, I just want to... We did this in the first video as well. Israel, can you tell us why Wainon the Tway was a brother of Koki the Tway, was your commander during the small tactic, as well as I believe uh, survival? Why is he important? Why why people know about Wainon the Tway? Yeah. After 10 years in Special Forces, I realized something. It doesn't matter if you become a small team's member operating only two guys, if you, if you become a sky god, love parachuting. If you become a seaborn soldier, you have to spend at least a year in the bush to experience that, to be shot at, to shot back, to fire a shot in anger. Otherwise, you're not ready for the more clandestine operations where you have to go and blow up things. Um, Vena was a good soldier. I think that's my point of view. Sorry, Vena. As good as you were, Vainan didn't have to push experience as a team leader, as yet, as his brother Koki, which had a lot of experience before. Um, so, because if you do even do a sea operation, once you climb off the boat you and you hit the beach, you are in the bush. And then it's exactly that drills that you did uh, when you deploy in Mozambique or anywhere else. That's the same drills there. 
And um, a, a couple of things went wrong. I believe they were compromised and instead of uh, settlism, our cover is blown. We have to move back. They carried on. And then, uh, yeah, the next day they were just surrounded by uh, quite a, a dis dispatchment of Limu, no, sorry, not Limu, Fapla, Angolan soldiers. Uh, totally outnumbered and heavy fire. I remember Queros were there. Queros speaks fluently Portuguese. He, he is from Angola. He's like a Malaja in between. Uh, and so he would be talking to the Fabla soldiers and they were insults back and forth, back and forth. And the guys start crawling away. And remember Louis from Badar, Liebenberg was the other guy. Uh, they leopard crawl, uh, Weinander Tweer as well. That was after an hours and hours of lull and fire shooting at each other. And they were caught. The other guys caught, uh, got away. They stand up and they were still in, in, mist, in between the enemy. So Louis was killed, Louis from Berda, and uh, Liebenberg, the other guy, was killed as well, and Weinand was shot through the shoulder or the neck, yeah, on the side. So yeah, so the basic thing is what I heard from the other guys, out of my experience, if you compromise, especially they de deployed so deep into Angola, if you compromise, you go. Even if you have did rehearsals for two or three months on that specific operation, it's not worth it carrying on. You're going to just hit on trouble after trouble. And that's what happened there. Yeah, yes, I just want to explain yeah, to those listening here is that you people were working behind enemy lines without any air cover or air extraction or anything like that. Once you dropped out of that aircraft, Behind the enemy lines, you're on your own, or wherever you are, yeah, or somewhere no, or whatever. There's no, no gunships, no artillery, no gunships, no mortar support. Only your rifle, the AK-47, with six magazines, one, two, yeah. three, seven, seven magazines. And as fast as you can run and get yourself out, so the entire idea is not to get caught, because yes, you know there's yes. six or ten of you against an army. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that makes it unique, by the way. There's, there's no way I think that the Western Special Forces are capable of, or might I say, crazy enough to even try to operate like that. But they don't do it. They yeah. are what you call heavy forces in the sense that they always have air support. Uh, they always have, you know, somebody like Marines coming to rescue them if really, really needs be. I don't want to go into that. I just want to say that African Special Forces were very, very unique in that in that sense. No air support, nothing. Okay, so Weinand, Weinand got caught. Uh, I know you're good friends with Weinand. Uh, nothing we said here was meant to be a criticism. It's just the way we saw it. And it's perhaps yeah, he's a, can he's a good soldier. I mean, it wasn't his decision to make it the team leader. Uh, but my experience working with the officers that was deployed for a long time in the bush that had actual contacts were better prepared for uh, the more clandestine operations, blowing up bridges, oil depots, trains, and things like that. You had to have that experience to know when you are compromised, locals saw you, uh, you hit the contact, what to do, that kind of thing. And you only got that uh, if you were at one or five at that stage. Four were not really deployed that much in the bush. They were more busy with their being assault divers. They had a specific job to do. That was assault diving, being skippers for the, the, the ski boats that deployed us. Of course, there were guys from one and five that did go to four that had that bush experience. So well, they perhaps, were- Perhaps you will have to explain to the, to the listener here yeah, now, uh, to the viewer, what, what are you talking about? What's one, five, and four? Yeah, four, four reconnaissance was another one in the Cape province, and they were trained to be uh, attack divers. Maritime. Attack divers or ski boat uh, skippers to deploy us, and then five were more working with uh, black soldiers, also becoming operators, went through the same process as us, uh, 
they were more deployed in, uh, they, their base were in Palabova, late and hot, and their operational base were Fort Ref in Odongwa. Like we had Fort Topis in the Caprivi. So that were the three units. And once you resigned, you will join two reconnaissance. And they would also be part of the bush uh, warfare, sea warfare, and so forth. Yes, and then they were yours who was like a parent regiment. It would be one reconnaissance yeah. commando, which became a, a one reconnaissance regiment. Yeah. Even though it was never quite as big as a regiment, this is a bit misleading. Okay, yeah. so now I've got that. So, so you had different units there. All right, let's go back quickly to um, small tactics. Where you were, the Israeli officers were there, they were quite impressed. They should have been, why not? And uh, Koki the Twice in charge. What else did you do there on uh, small tactics? Because every special forces member I spoke to tells me that is the actual selection inside the selection. Yeah, you would a lot right of night marches. Yeah, you would walk and then the instructors would initiate a, a contact to the left, a contact to the front, and you would do that fire movement drills. You would do somebody's as winded, and then you would do with fire movement to withdraw out of a target. Um, you would uh, do casualty, somebody's winded, somebody need to attend to him while the other guys give cover fire and you have to evacuate with that winded guy, how to carry him. We didn't have the fancy equipment yet. We only had that ground sheet. So four guys out of action plus the winded guy, five guys, if one guy is winded. And later on, there would be more fancy equipment to, to have only two guys carrying a casualty, uh, but not in my era. Um, then you would also, we did parachuting at night. Uh, there was uh, a moment we had our own airstrip very close by, so we would jump in, at grouping at night, uh, walking into RVs at uh, late afternoons, leaving RVs early in the morning, how to lay up, planting landmines, running at claymores, claymores. Each two guys, we were always operating in body pairs. Each two guys would have two claymores within uh, a team. Um, they would give you your signal equipment at night, a bag, and then you have to, at in the night, try to put everything together, operate it as if you're in the bush. And everything quiet, quiet. If you go into an RV and there's a little bit of a noise, you will do it over, 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 and over again until the instructors are happy with that. Yeah, so... so for all practical purposes, you are now operational, even though it's still an exercise. Um, we'll talk about that in the next episode when you go on your first missions. I just want yeah. to tell people, yeah, you people, uh, you would never really speak like we sit and speaking here right now, having a conversation while you're operational. It's a matter of being quiet all the time. You're fitting into that bush or felt. Yeah, you don't, you don't smoke. You, you don't, if you talk, you whisper. It's not like you're shouting to the guy that's lying on that side. It's quiet because that saves us a lot of time because you hear the enemy approaching you. So that is crucial, lying still there, because that is your last point. Keep a low profile, they mustn't know you're there. And if they approach you, you know first they are there. Okay, but now I have to ask you the, the one question which I've been asked from our previous recordings in Afrikaans. Why? Is there why? Why would you go through this 18 months of, I wouldn't call it hell, but it's close to hell, um, just to get that maroon beret and perhaps a blonde woman who strokes your wings. Uh, it's surely the most important than just that. I think uh, if, if uh, as a young kid, I always liked the adventure. I was all I like a little bit of a rebel. Uh, I liked the adventure. I liked the bush. When I had uh, no introduction of the defense forces yet, although the war would be on the northern part of Namibia. So it wasn't, I was just after the adventure. And yeah, that keeps me, that kept me there for 10 years. And I believe, of course, you wanted to be amongst the best. I mean, there's a certain amount of pride, which then will shoot me. Of course. Be, uh, 
I, I, think, I good... think if if I can if I can say something from the outside, I think sometimes you people were too humble. You have every reason in the world to be proud of what you did and what you uh, achieved. And yet, when you, we talk to people like you, uh, there's a humbleness which which I think comes from uh, faith. But but we yeah. will talk about faith later in, in probably the last. Episode. Yes, and it wasn't like we would have the speeches from the commissar, but the communists is going to take over our countries. We had never had speeches like that. It was only there's an enemy and you know, there's a bridge or something that we need to blow up. On the other side, the soldiers like like just like us. We didn't see them as communists or uh, this the red wave that's going to take over Africa. That was never on your mind. <laughs> Politics was nowhere with us as soldiers. Okay, so it's so a very last question. Once you're qualified now, you've gone through uh, the small tactical uh, phase as well, because we call it phases. Um, uh, what happens? Do you then get your uh, special forces parade and you know actually a member, or you, you still have to go on to on to the first operations and then they decide the whether you, you should no, be no, you're then qualified. You at that stage we didn't get the badges as yet; they didn't exist. That would only come a little bit later. Uh, what we can have that is a separate topic. Okay, but that the isn't a thing. Yeah, we'll we'll talk yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Well, I think, I think, unless you can think of something, I think we've covered your childhood, which is very interesting. And uh, we also covered this election, which is fairly unique because it changed afterwards. It became different, but in no way easier. That we also have to say it didn't become easier. And now you're like Trenton, and I can believe you want to go on operations. You know, where you say, well, let's go. And ready for the war. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I believe we'll talk about that one in the next episode, the first operations. Yes, great.